It's Friday night in the A, and you know what that means. Kelly Price and Tori McElhaney coming at you on Rise Up Tonight. Presented by AT&T. And it is a victory Friday in the A, y'all. Kelly Price, Tori McElhaney with you. And the Falcons got a win, but also the temperatures finally dip below 80 degrees, so it's sweater weather in full effect. You know, I've brought down all of my hoodies, so be prepared to see all of those. It is time. It is happening. And the vibes can't be anything but immaculate when you were talking about a Falcons dub. Time now to huddle up about it. Let's huddle up with Kelly and Tori on the world of Falcons football. And we got to start with the NFC Offensive Player of the Week, Cordero Patterson. Not only was this the first time CP was tapped with this honor, but he also smashed another career record on Sunday after setting his career rushing high week one against the Saints. The final stat line Sunday, 141 yards and a score on 17 carries. Oh yeah, and a league leading 8.3 yards per carry. It's wild to think about what he's doing because let's not forget, my guy is 31 years old. Everyone else in this locker room calls him Unk, and yet here he is having a career renaissance story. Here's the thing I really love about this. I don't think anyone expected CP to have the start that he has this year. Why? A lot of people on the outside looking in thought his success in 2021 was a fluke. Right. Here's a guy who spent a decade in the league before exploding offensively. Well, three games into this year, we see that no, last year was not a fluke. It's a fruition. Arthur Smith said after the win that Patterson is someone who has continued to evolve even at 31 years old. And let's not forget how this offensive line is playing right now either. CP is consistently getting to the second level of the defense. That has a lot to do with him and the guys blocking for him up front. And he made sure to give those guys a shout out post game on Sunday. So some other guys on this team kind of had a I told you so moment on Sunday. The Falcons fandom was melting down over Kyle Pitts and sure. I was right there with you guys. <laughs> he was like, all right, bet AJ Terrell doubters silence. Wasn't Sunday a little bit of a pump the brakes moment on some of these things that we've been worried about with this team? It absolutely was. I think this win in Seattle shows you just how much things can change from week to week. And look, I completely understand why people were underwhelmed by Kyle Pitts and A.J. Terrell's performance through the first two weeks. But let's remember, it's just the first two weeks. It's not the end of the world. And look, KP goes out there and has an 87-yard receiving day. A.J. performed very well on an island with D.K. Metcalf. Remember what I said on the show last week about not giving up on these two? Well, I hope Falcons fans believe me now that yes things are going to be okay with KP and AJ. So looking ahead the Falcons have a good shot at getting back to 500 this Sunday. Remember last season when it took them until week 16 to get a win inside Ooh. Mercedes Benz Stadium? Well they've got a shot to do that this week and make home really feel like home early on. We've talked a lot about how this team is maybe like two fumbles away from yeah. being three and oh too. Well here's their shot to right the ship show they've really made progress to get back to 500. Look if the Falcons can get to 500 this weekend that is a really nice step in the right direction not just for this team in 2022 but for the fan base too the Falcons have spoken a lot this week about getting a win at home it means a lot to them to be able to give a solid and productive performance at Mercedes-Benz Stadium on Sundays I really do think that they're really taking this to heart but a run first Browns team stands in their way and I will say stopping the run and being productive in their own run game is going to be a major storyline as we head into Sunday for sure well, as Deion Sanders once iconically said, look good, play good. And that's exactly what happened for the Falcons in Seattle. Let's take a look at Sunday's Falcons fix. We start with a veteran making his Falcons fifth debut yeah. in a big way. Casey Hayward, we love a good matching set, but if you look closely, this is not just your average set, no. Tori. This is baby blue leather, and he keeps it clean with some white sneakers, too. So I actually didn't know that this was a leather fit at first until someone <laughs> told me. I originally thought this looked like a pajama set that you can buy at Target, <laughs> but the knowledge of this being a leather set changes everything. And me. it's still comfortable, which, yes. which we are definitely here for. Felipe Franks may have been inactive on Sunday, but that did not stop him from making a fashion statement. He has another farewell to summer kind of moment here with the striped shirt, kind of like Casey's. What might go overlooked about the fit though? The floral duffel bag ah, that he yeah. is holding. It is either a bold move or maybe belongs to his girlfriend. Or Honestly, something. I like the addition of the bag a whole lot. It really <laughs> does add a little bit of summer vibes. I'd like to borrow it if that's okay. <laughs> another week, another Kadero Hodge Soleil. I love the contrast with the fun lime green sweater, the black jeans, the snap rack that really brings it all together in perfect harmony. And by the way, that snap kind of matches the whole outfit. You know, I really do like some gummies and 
they really do <laughs> add a certain feel to the whole look. Uh, but to be completely serious, I'm not usually a big fan of lime green, but this really works for him. And you gotta have the snacks, so he is prepared there. <laughs> Richie Grant iced the game with that late interception, and honestly, we should have all seen it coming with the icy fit that he mm. wore before the game. I love the subtle checkered suit, but I also love how he dressed it down with an unbuttoned shirt and sneakers, all business in this look. I'm here for that. I think the word I used when I was talking to Richie about his suit post game in the locker room was fly, which is not a word that I use lightly. <laughs> Well, speaking of fly, we've heard about this defense flying around all season, but what if some of the players could actually fly? We found out this week that some of them would actually pick that as their superpower if given the chance in our question of the week. Probably to fly. Yeah, I, I, I don't see you can go wrong with that. I mean, um, I guess there's a lot to choose from, but flying, I don't think you can beat that. I mean, it seems pretty cool to me. Mind reading. Mind reading, why is that? I think it'd be fun, it'd be pretty cool. I would say super speed, so I get anywhere, beat the traffic, and just get where I gotta go fast. I had so many dreams as a kid about flying. So I'd probably be flying. Yeah, I'd probably be Superman or somebody. I'm with Young Way Koo. The mind reading would be mm. really good. And then for him, he can know, all right, this guy's going to try to block me, so I got to do this differently. That's nice. I, you know, we just got back from Seattle. That was a long flight. I would like to <laughs> teleport. That Ooh, would make things so much easier. That is very solid. Well, still to come here on Rise Up tonight, we welcome street artist Greg Mike back to the show to talk about his new gallery and, of course, his love for the A. And the Falcons welcome three girls flag football teams from Montana for a big football weekend in Seattle. That story is next on Rise Up tonight. Rise Up Tonight is presented by AT&T and brought to you by Georgia Lottery. Today could be the day. By Home Depot, how doers get more done. By Mercedes-Benz, the best of nothing. And by Truett, committed to a better future. Well, the Falcons have been huge supporters of girls flag football in Georgia, starting in 2018 in Gwinnett County at 19 high schools to now 240 schools across the state, plus now expanding into Alabama and Montana. And three of those Montana teams actually got to take part in Falcons walkthrough in Seattle list last week as we rise up for Atlanta, brought to you by Truist. Last week, 75 girls and five coaches from Butte, Flathead, and Glacier High Schools in Montana bust into Seattle from Kalispell, Montana. They got to go to the Falcons walkthrough and Stanford Washington game on Saturday, and then the Seahawks Falcons game on Sunday. For a lot of these girls, it was their first time seeing an NFL team live, and several were really emotional, as you can see in these pictures. And Troy Anderson, who is Mr. Montana, of course, <laughs> must be their biggest hero. Tori, you were there too. What was it like to see the players and girls kind of interact. It really was fun for me to, to get to see and talk to some of these girls and see them interact with some of these players. And I'll say this too, these girls interacting with Troy Anderson was <laughs> fantastic. I mean, I, I, I loved watching it. It was really cool to see. And I mean, here's a guy who is the pride of Montana right now for these girls to meet and they absolutely loved it. Also, a lot of the girls had the guys updating uh, their B reels with them. And I swear 90% of the guys had no earthly idea what that was, but the girls loved it. So really that's all that matters. Yeah, that's all that matters. Well, these girls also saw a heck of a game on Sunday. Lots of offense, 800 total yards between the Seahawks and the Dirty Birds. And as you wrote on your notebook on AtlantaFalcons.com, the Falcons defense certainly bent, but it didn't break. Seattle was two for five in the red zone, settling for three field goals and only two touchdowns allowed. Oddly, both 18 yard passes which was kind of random. <laughs> Obviously easier to say this now when you win, but is this what Dean Pease is looking for from his guys? I'm paraphrasing here, but Dean Pease has said on a few occasions, look, I don't care how many yards we give up. I care how many points is, are scored on us. And that's exactly what we saw last Sunday. Heck, Seattle had over 400 yards of total offense. If you're looking at that alone, you're like, well, why didn't they win? <laughs> well, because the Falcons defense held down the line that really matters, which is the goal line. Absolutely. Well, speaking of rushing yards, the Falcons had 179, the Seahawks had 112, but there was a Corgi on the loose at <laughs> Lumen Field after this Corgi race they had at halftime, and he had like 150 yards scrambling, which you're about to see right here. This guy is so evasive, and that is some SEC speed if I've ever seen it, Tori. Look at this little floof go. I would like <laughs> to petition officially for every halftime entertainment moving forward to be the Corgi Cup. I mean, look. <laughs> <laughs> this is the joy that we would get every week. Yeah, and someone needs to draft that guy. Sign him. <laughs> he can help someone's practice squad at least. 
Well, we are again two for two on our hot takes. It's like we know what we're talking about or something wow. over here. Stay tuned to see what our expert picks are for this week. And the man behind some of the coolest murals you've seen around Atlanta joins us next on Rise Up Tonight. Rise Up Tonight is presented by AT&T and brought to you by Georgia Lottery. Today could be the day. By Home Depot, how doers get more done. By Mercedes-Benz, the best of nothing. And by Truett, committed to a better future. Welcome back to Rise Up Tonight. Let's head in the nest with Kelly, Tori, and this week's special guest. Brought to you by Mercedes-Benz. All right, well, in the nest with us today is street artist Greg Mike, who is actually, I think, our first guest that we've had twice on the show. You were once on the show when Harry Douglas and Sudu were on it. Um, but so welcome back. Um, we talked a little bit last time you were here about Atlanta and you being here and kind of how you were one of those transplants, kind of like me. Um, you know, what has kept you in Atlanta and what kind of drew you here at first? Yeah, so I, I came to Atlanta from um, Tallahassee. I was going to school at Florida State. Uh, many moons ago and, and now I've been in Atlanta almost close to 20 years but yeah it was just one of those cities that I was drawn to and there's just so much going on from just like a culture perspective and, and just like you know art in general like street art and, and that whole movement and just really inspired me you know I've traveled all over the world now and I just keep you know keep wanting to stay and, and, and live in Atlanta you know it's just it's got so much going on so I'm hyped to be a part of it. Now, I am a big uh, MCU superhero type fan, so I love an origin story. So I would love to know what got you into art in the first place? How did this hobby and, and this passion really set fire for you? Yeah, I mean, I can, I've can. i been doing art as long as I can remember since I was probably, you know, eight or nine years old. Um, grew up skateboarding, just loved all the skateboard graphics on the bottom of the skateboard decks. Um, used to try to redraw those and, and I remember just sitting in front of my TV and watching all the mid-century retro cartoons growing up watching all that and yeah I think you know as a kid you just you draw what's around you right um, before you start exploring kind of what you're seeing you know in the world and interpreting in your own way you're kind of just taking things and trying to to replicate them um, so yeah I was doing that a lot and then I got kind of skateboarding got me into the graffiti scene and the street art scene and uh, painting on the streets and, and that kind of led into the murals and, and the bigger walls and, and things that I do now but yeah that's kind of was the entry point and it's just kind of grown since then. All of our viewers driving around Atlanta could recognize your work immediately you have it behind you it's it's very recognizable and you have that um collab with the Falcons a couple of years ago on Edgewood Avenue I'm sure a lot of people have driven by that in the past what was it like to work with the Falcons and could there be another project with them or any other kind of sports team coming up? Yeah, um, I mean, it was a dream project, obviously, you know, I've always wanted to work with the Falcons and, you know, it was awesome to be able to play with like some of the iconic uh, imagery uh, from some of the logos and branding elements and kind of work them into my piece. But yeah, I mean, that one, you know, a lot of my work is very loud and, and it's just based on, you know, bold colors and, and energetic line, you know, line work and, and things of that nature. And I feel like there's a lot of similarities with the Falcons and the energy of the team. So it was cool to kind of take those two and, and mesh them together. Um, but yeah, hey, if, if there's a, if there's a call and, and we're, you know, there's a project, I'm definitely going to do it. So, you know, it's always a blessing working with them. So it's, it's uh, definitely something I'd love to do again in the future. That's awesome. When, you know, for me, I'm not very artistic. I don't see the world in that way. And so anytime I meet someone who, who does think in that way and thinks visually, I mean, I always wonder about the different projects that they're doing now. You just opened an exhibit, a uh, six by six at ABV gallery. What is kind of the difference between making an exhibit in and of itself versus maybe your work doing murals and, and all, all those kind of things? What's the difference in that? Yeah, so for me, I mean, like uh, one thing that I always say is is my motto is kind of like by a, by any medium necessary, right? So that could be, you know, creating a piece of paper that's just a drawing on, on you know, some pen and ink drawing on, on regular paper to, painting a massive 40 foot wall. I think there's different things and different emotions and, and different things that you can convey depending on the scale and size of work, you know, and it's it's nice also have have having things in the street where someone that might not ever walk into ABV, our gallery, um, might never see the art. So putting art on the streets, you know, I definitely think it hits a wider audience and there's 
kind of more of an exciting element to it, I think, too, when you just kind of like happen upon some art that you see in the streets. Maybe you're just in a new city or you're cruising around a corner and then you just kind of get hit with the, you know, colors and, and uh, art and makes you think and makes you wonder a little bit more versus a gallery where you're like, OK, you know, you're going there to seek out and look for art. Um, so I think it's it's two different types of way of, of experiencing art, both which are great and, and have different purposes. And, you know, getting art into people's homes is also exciting as well and personal collections. And, and that's always a, you know, a blessing and a humbling thing when you know that someone wants to live with your art and look at it every single day versus public art. You know, you kind of whatever is put out in the public, it's just who drives by is going to experience it. I'm curious, when you have an idea, do you think when you first have that idea, oh, this would be really good in like a traditional kind of gallery? Or do you think of it as like, this needs to be on a wall? Is that something you think in like the concept stage yeah, or I mean, like when you actually start doing it? It's usually once I know what I'm creating for, then the idea will kind of come together based on that. Like right now I'm working on a, a massive wall and it's for a project in Cincinnati in a few weeks. And uh, yeah, they send me photos and measurements of the wall. And then once I look at it and I kind of do some research on the community and the neighborhoods and uh, take inspiration from the history and um, then that kind of creates and, and molds the idea. Very cool. Well, thanks so much for coming back on Rise Up tonight, everyone. Go check out at Greg Mike. You'll be able to see all these awesome projects. The visuals um, are fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on. Anyone who wants to check out the full conversation that we have, go to fox5atlanta.com and we'll be right back on Rise Up tonight. Hey Atlanta, this is Head Crack talking, and you watching Rise Up Tonight, presented by AT and T. It's like I don't get caught up in whatever narrative is after four weeks of the daily narratives. It, you can almost write some of these narratives and live and die every week by the narratives because it sets up bad, you know, narratives. So you can frame the narrative, you can write narratives. So those are easy narratives. And here comes some more narratives. Tori and I were two for two with our hot takes last week. Feeling pretty confident going into week yeah. four here. I am going to talk about the defense tonight. Last week was a big growth moment, I thought, for this defense, which keeps proving to themselves and to those outside the organization that they can make those clutch plays and change the game on that side of the ball. I look forward to them doing that again this Sunday. Cleveland has one of the strongest offensive lines in the league, and their skill position players are a big strength. And they have the league's leading rusher in Nick Chubb. Of course, they will be no Deshaun Watson, but Jacoby Brissett has been serviceable in his place. The Browns average 28 points a game, so it's a tall task for Dean Pease and company. But I think this Falcons defense is poised for another step forward. The pass rush is already showing huge signs of improvement with the emergence of TQ Graham, who, by the way, leads this team with five quarterback hits as well as Orlando Carter, Michael Walker, Arnold Ebikati, and Ade Ogundeji. They're already on pace to double their 18 sacks from a season ago. They gave up more yards on the ground to Seattle than they would have liked, but overall in the season, they're really middle of the NFL pack as far as rush and pass defense stats go. The key is stopping the Browns on the ground, and they are pumped for that challenge. So I'm excited to see it play out on Sunday. And Tori, I know you have something to say about that as well. Yeah, I'm going to stick with the run game for a minute. And if for my hot take, I know I'm going to take a a lot of heat from my own alma mater saying this, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. Cordero Patterson is going to outgain Nick Chubb on Sunday. Ooh. I feel like I need to duck and cover saying that, but regardless, <laughs> I think this is something I am really looking forward to seeing. Nick Chubb is the NFL's leading rusher. CP is third on that list. Nick Chubb is averaging 5.5 yards a carry. CP is averaging 6.1 yards a carry. And I think there's going to be connection between these two players' success in the run game and their respective team success at, on Sunday as well. And if Jadavian Clowney and Miles Garrett don't play, the Browns could really be turning to rookies in their place. So one more thing to hit on here. I think we can all agree that was the best collective performance that we've seen from this Atlanta offense. Mm -hmm. The balance and production between the run and the passing game, obviously leading the way to a win. How does the offense really just keep that rolling against Cleveland. Yeah, so Arthur Smith said something that I thought was very interesting this week when talking about the offense's production. He said momentum doesn't really carry over from one week to the other, which I found very interesting. The Falcons have to create, continue to create that offensive momentum as soon as the ball is kicked off on Sunday and a new game begins. If the Falcons can start quick and seemingly carry that production forward, that would be very promising for the offense overall, especially running the ball. Again, that's a huge storyline coming into this Sunday. Absolutely. Well, that'll do it for us. Thanks for staying up late with us here on Rise Up tonight. For Tori McElhaney, I'm Kelly Price. We'll see you again back here next Friday night to talk about what happens on Sunday with the Browns and the Falcons. Good night.